Uh, here we go. Uh, how was lunch? I hope it was good. Uh, so this, this particular session is, is kind of a funny one, and I say funny one because it was not supposed to be a session. I was supposed to be giving a technical session on some other stuff that I have passion for, but because I proposed this as a session at an on-conference where everybody was discussing the topic then, now we're here. So what I'm saying all this is, I have some slides, I have some content, but I'm also willing to open the floor for having a healthy and an interesting discussion about sci-fi and geeking out and no hiking. <laughs> so, <laughs> when I was a, a kid, uh, I grew up in the middle of the jungle. I come from Colombia. And uh, my bubble at the time, my whole world, was just going from home to school and back. But because of also a Mexican, I understand how planes work, and I was able to fly to a different country. So I got in touch in some sort of technology, but I also buried my head into books. And I consumed the whole family library, and we had plenty of books, and many of them were by Julius Benn. So I got excited about uh, fantasy and technology. Sadly, I did not read uh, Lord of the Rings or anything else. I was not into that kind of, of fantasy until much later. <laughs> so I kept going on and eventually found about Isaac Asimov. And uh, yes, of course, robots, the three laws of robotics and a few more things. And I said, yeah, this is great. And then, of course, I discovered video games. And I dumped everything. And I just wanted to play video games and watch some TV. You might remember this guy. Who remembers Automan? I can't believe you guys are such, such babies. <laughs> and, I mean, and I say it in a, in a good way. You guys are so young. This is great. Although, when this show was on screen live, this was the best thing ever. We saw holograms. We saw things uh, just happening by computers that were not supposed to be, uh, well, they were quite advanced. But they were put in a setting that was supposed to be just a few years ahead of us, or pretty much right there. So was, that was a little bit of a, a shock to young viewers. And then, of course, we got this masterpiece, this masterpiece. The original one, not, <laughs> not the other one. Okay? <laughs> and this, was, this is also one of those movie features where we got good computer-generated graphics. So what we see today with CGI, Lord of the Rings, Marvel movies, this was, the, this was not the first one, but it's one of the, one of the first I saw, saw saying, oh, I can't believe you can do that. And you know what? Not only do I want to find out if I can digitize myself into the digital world and do cool stuff with programs and interact with programs, I want to know how I can create these kind of things. And that's eventually what I did when I joined college. And uh, yeah, these guys are fun. You can, there are many video games related to this one. We finally got a good view about these ones. Don't look at the neutron, or if you want to. Anyway. But another thing that happened uh, during this time frame, well, actually, this happened before I was born, but we got a Star Trek. And these inspired not just one, not just two, but three generations about the, uh, the topics that were covered, like it's, it's, it's proposed as an utopia, where the whole humanity has shed it most, not all of it, but most of it barbaric ways. And we no longer care about money. We care about the bettering of humankind itself. That's uh, something that I really definitely would like to strive for. And there were many gadgets and few things that were used through the show to showcase, hey, we are living in the 23rd century, so of course, some of things have evolved. So, really quick quiz. What is the best Star Trek movie that exists out there right now? <laughs> I'm sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> That's a close second. That's a close yeah. Most people, that are really hardcore uh, Star Trek fans will say is uh, Star Trek number two, The Wrath of Khan. I hope this is not offensive enough. <laughs> uh, but in, this, in the sense of uh, the Star X shows go, I would say this is the best one. Because it, leaves, it, it, puts, it poses a, a, a universe that is close to ours, and both Star Wars and Star Trek exist. 
So this is a superset of the other ones. Take that, Gary. But some people believe that Stargate is pretty much a MacGyver in space. And yes, <laughs> the first season is very campy. And that, yeah, it's MacGyver in space. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, of course, we have lots of influences from Star Wars. I guess the, the technology-wise, the, uh, the brand new thing that, that comes from these um, from the original series, let's not talk about the prequels or the, uh, the sequels and whatnot, are the lightsabers. It's, it's, it's so prevalent in, in our culture that when the, uh, the new breed of MacBooks came out 12 years ago, that they have an accelerometer, the first thing that came out for someone found out how to hack the accelerometer to create an application that the, mo the way that you move the, uh, the uh, laptop, it will make the saber sounds. Of course, it was very popular. Okay, moving on. I'm just rambling. Feel free to stop me at any time. The, uh, when I thought about this particular uh, topic is because many years ago, I watched this documentary. Uh, yes, William Shatner is a famous Canadian thespian, and uh, he can be a little bit uh, self-centered, but we love him for that. And that this particular documentary is actually, uh, I think it's three hours, also, uh, it's, it's also three, series, three, three parts of this thing. And the point is not William Shatner himself, it's his participation in the Star Trek and Star Trek The Next Generation series, uh, the tech that was presented at those uh, shows, how it affected our technology and our society in the 80s and the 90s and so forth. Now, one of the examples that is shown in this series, and I'm not going to spoil everything because it's a good watch, is that one time Commander Data was uh, listening to music and he asked the computer to play a particular area. And then he was looking for more, more, and more, and more, and more. And ba basically, he's showing that he can access all of humanity's musical creation and that is available in the computer's library. And that uh, one of the uh, Apple engineers saw this, and that's the inspiration for QuickTime. We would not have QuickTime and everything that came after if it weren't because of a campy show in the 60s, Star Trek Next Generation. Well, uh, Star Trek and the Next Generation happened in the late 80s. We also saw on that show, this particular device is a communicator uh, nowadays, uh, well, at that time, we looked very fancy, very revolutionary, because we only have a handful of buttons, and they were round, not a square. And, uh, but, yeah, if we were to use this kind of tech today, that, that's really old-fashioned. But, I don't know if that's actually true, but I will hope that it's true, that it serves as an inspiration for uh, some designs for the upcoming uh, mobile phones, so, for example, this one. And this one. Actually, I just moved home a, few, uh, uh, a month ago, and I was going through my stuff, and I found I have still have this phone. And this one, I, I should have brought it. Uh, just slide your thumb, and it'll open up. How cool is that? Well, it was cool at the time, and I thought it was cool. The best design ever, and then we got some other stuff. We also got this thing. It's called a tricorder. And that is supposed to be a medical device that can scan for any kind of things, uh, radiation and, and problems inside the body. It can do a lot of things, but not that picture. At the time it was designed, it's bulky. It has lots of buttons. Here's another picture of a tablet from the next generation. Notice that the screen is so small, and it still has buttons. This was in the late 80s, early 90s. About the time when Sun and James Gosling decide to prototype the Star 7 uh, thing, but as much as you browse Google for more stuff about Star 7, you only find this picture. I think this is James Gosling hand handling the uh, Star 7, and there's only a video as well. There's nothing more about Star 7, I don't know why. But it has been touted as Sun's precursor to the iPad many years ago. Of course, we got these guys. Well, I should probably have put the, uh, the Apple Newton, which was before this thing, that time. Then the creators of Palm Pilot said, uh, screw this. Uh, we want to create something else. And they created another company and the Bison. And I actually have one of this. Was very happy. Was very late in the game in, after the 2000s. 
Uh, look at that. The screen is monochromatic and still has buttons. And it's actually bulky. Uh, Star Trek Enterprise. For those that are fans of Star Trek, forgive me, I have to show Enterprise. It's not part of Gene's uh, legacy per se because he was no longer involved. It, it deviates from his vision, but they have a tablet that still has buttons. Or look, what about this one? They later change it. Hey, no buttons, but it looks ugly. So of course we have something that looks like this. The button has gone away. We still have the side buttons. And, uh, but nowadays we have these kind of phones where the buttons are again just on the sides. Are we going to get a version of these devices without buttons? Maybe. This is the bridge of the Star Trek Enterprise from the, uh, the next generation. And the important thing about not just the bridge, but the whole ship is that anyone could just simply say, computer, tell me about this. And the computer will listen and react to commands and reply and do stuff. So this is an environment that can detect when someone is speaking a command, it can detect who that person is, and it, it can reply very quickly. Of course, there's a really highly supercomputer behind this. But the point is voice recognition and reaction. So I say that we are still in the early stages. This is not the only device that does this. And uh, depending on your accent, your pronunciation, your command will not be understood and will probably do something else. We have also seen this thing, this is a two-way communicator. You just simply tap it and that is, uh, you start the conversation or at any point someone can uh, go through. Well, do we have something like this? Kind of, maybe. You don't tap this thing, but at least it goes directly into your ears and they are more mobile. We also have this guy, come from many different brands and different makers. But uh, one of the things perhaps for, for those of you that are from very previous generations, you can feel like this now. It happened from the 30s, almost 100 years later, we finally got Dick Tracy's watch. How amazing is that? Here's another piece of technology that right now seems really far away from attainable from our current means. This is a matter replicator. It is being said that the Starship Enterprise, half of its content is pretty much raw materials. Why? Because they need their L gray coffee, their L gray tea hot. And how do they make it? They need those raw materials. Everything else is so those big enterprise ships and all this these constitution class ships, they're just transport ships. Anyway, do we have something like this? Right now we don't what we may be looking in some sort of that future with 3D printers. Right now, we can print all kind of small stuff, but we also already get into the market of printing food. There is not just one, there is not just two, there are not that many restaurants around the world that all that they do is use organic ink, so some kind of paste, and they'll print out the meal for you. How cool is that? Don't get ahead of yourself, please. <laughs> yes, we can 3D print houses already. Now, uh, it may be cement or something else, some, other, some sort of material, but we can print them out on the spot. It only takes a handful of days, and off you go. And this, actually, may be one of the ways that we could create colonies on Mars. Because the only thing that we need to do is get the first batch of printers, the basic ones, that will print the next generation, that will use the raw materials from Mars to build those, th those things. Instead of just shipping everything, it will be very, very costly to move the, the raw materials from the Earth or from or meteorites or comets so that we can build something on Mars. We just use the materials that are already existing in Mars. We need a technology to make this happen. 3D printing may be it. And if we had the technology, we just simply uh, just ship it like this. But we don't. We can't. Because this is a plot device that the, uh, that the writers of the, the Star Trek, the original series, had to use because it was very expensive. 
to create the effects of a small shuttle going from the big starship into the planet. That was it. It was not because they wanted to do something cool, it's because they didn't have the money <laughs> to do the right effects. <laughs> but we got teleportation now, and it is also now it's a different plot device. Do we have teleportation now? No, but we got these guys. <laughs> we are still in the early stages, but it's basically something like that. Yeah, it takes time, it's not instant, and we don't have to think about Heisenberg compensators because otherwise the matter will, will go somewhere other place. What about this? When the next generation came out, uh, they, they wanted to, to showcase uh, uh, different alien races and different conditions of humankind. So we have uh, a blind person that is able to interact. He's, he is an officer, and he's able to interact with everybody else because he has a special visor. It not only allows uh, Jordi LaForge to see what, how we normally see, we, how we would see with our eyes, but some other kind of um, uh, spectrum. Do we have something like this? Yes, we did, and we failed. Well, kind of. Are we going to come back to this? Likely. Why? Because this is cool. <laughs> then we got, who remembers this movie? Uh, a bit of, uh, no, this is not The Sixth Sense. It's the same actor. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is AI, artificial okay. intelligence. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not going to spoil the, uh, the end. Uh, yeah, interesting movie. But the point is that this particular show showcases how advanced robotics were so that AI will interact with humans in such a way that you, it will be very, very hard to differentiate a synthetic being from a um, real human. And actually, that's part of the uh, dilemma of the movie. Finding yourself as a synthetic being, are you actually real or not? And by real, we only think in biological terms. And we have, of course, commander data. Here's another point that the next generation tried to say. We have an android that behaves just like android. It's just not human. So what makes us human? Feelings. Like laughter. This is data experiencing his first laughter. And of course, he overdoes it, because he doesn't understand. We have another show, The Byzantine Man, where another synthetic being goes through a journey and becomes biological. And it actually, does any, has anybody not seen this movie? Don't want to spoil it completely. It's a journey of the synthetic man into the biological man that goes from non-human to more than human. Really cool. Right now we have Sophia. This is the, perhaps one of the most advanced of the AI and robotics that it's capable of understanding what we're saying. It's not self-conscious, not yet. And uh, the, the facial expressions that can provide are very close to human-like. It's so human-like that we can develop empathy for a synthetic being. We have to be careful. <laughs> because uh, if, we go, if we overdo these things, then uh, we can get into that one. Although, this is the good one, remember? <laughs> Terminator 2. There's also another point of caution, where the big overseeing AI believes the given command is protect humanity, and the only way to protect humanity against itself is put them in cages, because we are irrational. We can do stupid things that the AI will say, oh, that's a stupid, why did you guys don't recognize that? Has anybody seen this show? I'm a fan of this show. It. It's really cool in here. It's another synthetic being, that guy over there, that's a robot, that has a synthetic soul. Supposed to be the way that a robot can become human, in the sense that it will behave like a human, it will feel like a human, yet it's not biological. It's, they show some other stuff that I have seen appear in other, um, in previous, uh, shows like uh, uh, DNA altering, biological weapons and whatnot. There's nothing really breathtaking in terms of new tech. They have drones also. Uh, but it's a fun show. Lastly, sadly, it was canceled. It was only one season. Now, for those of you that are familiar with the Japanese content, don't blame me for this. 
This is a synthetic being that has a human brain. So this depicts how advanced cybernetics could be. Here's another way, again, sorry for not showing the original source material. There's another, there's another human brain inside a synthetic body. And what this shows the pig besides the, uh, the violence and the fun and, and the music and whatnot is that tragic um, path that the, um, that the character follows once identifies that it has lost, they have apparently lost their humanity because they are only brains within synthetic bodies. So if we advance our society such that we can create cybernetic beings like this, are we going to encounter these problems where the beings don't see themselves as fully human or more than human? Or, I don't know. I think we're still some decades uh, behind being able to do this. But the point is this kind of technology, this kind of visuals, will certainly influence some of us or the next generation to say, can we do this? And then we come back to what Mike said, should we be doing this? Here's another inter interesting movie, right? The precogs try to predict crime and prevent it before it happens, so you are guilty before you even know it. But, of the main things that I show, we see this incredible display where Tom Cruise puts these special gloves and starts to move things around, right? It's just in the air and see these interesting pictures. Well, this is back in, when was this movie created? Uh, I think more than 15 years ago. Of course, nowadays, we got Tony Stark. And this is cool because it's just, these are 3D holograms that you can interact with. And did you notice where are the sensors? We have no explanation how Tony Stark is able to interact with the holograms. We also got these incredible visuals. But uh, let me tell you something. We may not be able today to have these incredible 3D holograms that look very crispy <coughs> and interact with them, but we have this. This tech already exists, projects a keyboard, and based on the position of your fingers, based on, on the, uh, the interference of your fingers, how they obstruct the light, then this device is able to tell, oh, you're pressing the A key. So I will react. And this can work on any surface unless, as long as it can be projected. Granted, again, it's not a hologram. It's not a solid hologram, but it's a beginning. You guys remember this one? You remember this moment from Back to the Future 2 where Marty McFly discovered one of these very, very old vintage, let's call them vintage, uh, <laughs> cowboy video games. And he was one of the best. So he, so he grabbed the, uh, the gun and started shooting and makes the best score. That's Elijah Wood, by the way. That was one of his <laughs> first uh, movie shots. And then, what happened? Do you remember exactly what happened later? So this is supposed to be 2015, four years ago, right? <laughs> We're supposed to be dressed like that, with a calendar on our heads, right? So what happened right after this? That face of disgust. Because Elijah was said, ugh, you have to use your hands to play this? Oh, let's go. That's exactly what happened. Nowadays, we still play with our hands, but now we see uh, with the PlayStation and, and the other consoles, uh, we still have some, some funny things that look like uh, ice cream cone or some kind of a sphere, <laughs> and, the, and then the Wii. And, but at some point, we will get, we'll grow out of using physical objects to represent what we see in the augmented reality. Another movie. Interesting book, terrible movie. <laughs> that device you see there is not a movie prop. This exists. This is real. Actually, the makers of the movie said, oh, let's put this into there. It's an endless treadmill. It can go 360. It senses when you start to move so that it adjusts the bands so that it keep going and going and going. It's tech that we have for like two years already. How about this? Again, from Minority Report. I think this is what Facebook is aiming for. <laughs> Custom, tailored, personalized, individual ads on your face, no matter where you look at. <laughs> is this the future we want? 
because it looks like we're heading to that way with facial recognition to the, nowadays. Or what about this? Deep fake. Now we can create videos that look so real that it's difficult to, to figure out if it's actually real or not. It's already put in production in a couple of countries doing what they shouldn't be doing. How about this? A car that can drive itself. You can do whatever you want, you can even sleep on it and don't get blamed because some guy was sleeping on the highway, that happened like two weeks ago, right? Um, he was sleeping on his Tesla. He shouldn't be doing that, but come on, the car drives itself. What's, what, why wouldn't I just take one extra hour of sleep if I'm going to work, even if it takes like two hours to go there? Well, yes, we have self-driving cars too nowadays. There are a few wrinkles that need to be ironed out, but for most of it, I think we're almost there in terms of tech. So that's pretty good. Now let's turn, no, not really back to the future, let's look into the future. I don't know, it's really hard to get. I found a, uh, some kind of title that shows future in a really compelling way, so I use this one. Uh, here's another show from the 80s. And yeah, it has some interesting tech, but the point is that this is a dysfunctional society where Life is controlled by a handful of mega corporations, the zigzag corporation. Hopefully this will not be Apple, Microsoft, Google, and everybody else roll into one. If we don't stop them on time, this could be our future, and this guy is just a buffon that keeps us in line. Also, uh, an interesting use of something that looks like 3D, but it's not. This is just practical effects. How about this movie? Anybody seen this movie? The key plot, plot of, uh, element of this movie is that kids are, when kids are born, they have an implant on their brains that will record all, everything that they see, all their life. And when people die, then comes a guy, in this case was Robin Williams' character, uh, that will take out all the recordings, use a machine called a guillotine, and then create a video that will go into your tombstone so that you, everybody could see your life. There were people in the society that were against these recordings, so this is a notion of what about privacy. And they used special tattoos with electronics and, and some kind of special ink that will interfere with the implant. Because the thing is, everyone in this society is not aware if they have or not an implant. How about this one? Genetic engineering. We have the means today. We have CRISPR. It is debated and debated that it's not ethical to play around with the human DNA. Scientists have been playing with DNA from other species. But humans are supposed to be out of the game. Or are we? So what this particular, uh, and this has been discussed, also shown in previous books and in other places, but Genetic engineering goes in such a way that they create the best possible set of humanity, and then there's the rest. So these guys, they are the rich ones, the, the, the smart ones, the beautiful ones, but of course you need the hard workers. How about this one? Anyone seen this movie? Again, humanity has advanced in such a way that we can create robotics, that get linked to our, uh, our brains so that we can live our life to the fullest because we don't put our fragile biological bodies into harm. We just put machines into harm. But this creates another problem, which is become zombies. We live life through a machine. We don't live a life ourselves. How about this one? The plot of the movie is that there is again another implant in our brains and you can be con remotely controlled by another human. So there are, there are times where, and there is a version of Facebook called Happy Town, I think, <laughs> where you become someone else and that someone else is a live human and you live your experiences through that human. It's no longer a robot, it's another human. So remotely controlled humans. Think about that. About this one. 
another moment where we were able to create far, uh, very highly advanced synthetic beings. They evolve the last, what's it, Nexus 6? They evolve in such a way that they really feel they are more human than human, though they have limited lifespans. Everyone seen this one? Another one of, of, of uh, implant on the brain, in this case, memory. This guy, Kenny Reeves, is a courier, and he needs to send data from one place to the other, and the only way they can do it is this. There are some bad guys that want to hack him. There is a super duper hacker that happens to be a dolphin, because we know dolphins are the smartest species on the planet. That's what uh, we know from Hitchhiker Guys for the Galaxy. Yeah. <laughs> And then, of course, the ep epitome of geek movies, at least I think so, this one. Is that a coincidence that Kino is there? Is there again? <laughs> so humanity has advanced so far, has created AI, and again, the AI says, uh, you guys are broken. But we don't want to recognize it, so we get in war with them, and of course, we lose because we are not capable. And then uh, they put us into the simulation so that we, we are slaves because they use them for our energy, but it's been debunked the amount of energy that a human can output is enough for a machine to survive. Anyway, the Wachowski didn't know exactly what they're doing in this case in, in scientific terms. It's a really cool movie. The other ones do not exist. They do not exist. We are not going to discuss the other ones, okay? <laughs> How about this one? Keanu is some kind of god. <laughs> That's what I gather from here. So I'm definitely waiting for what's going on next in his, in his next sci-fi movie. But, and, and I really like, uh, again, Mike, yes, I saw it on your sleeve. So some of these movies, I, and I haven't even touched the whole point of cyberpunk, where all these dystopian futures come to be. Uh, there is some tech that already exists that has, has definitely been influenced by all these shows even campy shows, my guy on the space. Uh, there is some tech that is upcoming that is certainly attainable. And there is some tech that I don't think we'll be able to, uh, to build in our universe, which is the Star Trek transporters. But the point is that we have now have what this, the, the tech that we have is running for, it's been about since uh, World War II, so it's what, 70, 80 years now that we have this quick advance of tech year after year after year after year. It's so quick that we no longer stop to think, should we be doing this? It's just, oh, look, how cool, I can do this now. And uh, some of the decisions that we make today will definitely affect our immediate future and future generations. So it's been said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. It's also been said, that we, we as, a, as an industry, we are the king makers. We are the ones that were able to put Mark Zuckerberg on top. We are also the ones that can help bring him down in case that he definitely goes really, really bad. Or anyone else. I'm just using him because it's easy to pick at him. <laughs> but there are other people as well. There are other companies. There will be other corporations that will be aiming to do that. And we are the enablers. We are the ones that can stop this. We are the ones that can take the reins back and do something about this. I'm an Oracle employee, so I'm obliged to show you this. Everything that I said, don't take it into consideration. So, I think I, I finished a little bit early. As I said, I have some slides, and I want to turn this into uh, an interactive discussion. So, uh, you have the floor. Yes. As consumers, or we said that we should try to take power back from, you know, things like Facebook and stuff. But uh, particularly my generation, things like Facebook and Instagram, they shape our reality. So how exactly do we break away from the Sunday control? So this is the plot of the final cut. So in a way, Facebook and this social media has been ingrained into this generation that there are many individuals that don't consider life without it. But there are those that resist. There have been people that, once they have been inside Facebook, they just go away. 
And in, this, in the movie, these rebels use this ink to and, and the tools to stop their recording. So do we have something like that in our current life to stop the social networks from changing our behavior? The first thing that we could say is, yeah, turn it off. But these social networks are addictive. They're like a drug. So if we treat them like that, how do we treat drug addiction? Uh, addiction? We just have to go to a doctor. We have to seek medical advice. In the case of social networks, we have to go to the psychiatrist, very likely. L seek for psychological advice. I don't have a, a real answer here because I'm still part of the product. I still use Facebook from time to time. I use it because I want to keep tabs on my family, on my friends. I want to let them know, hey, look, this beautiful place out there. I wish you were here. I want to come with you next time. It's like waking up from the matrix. Yeah. How do you know, if you're inside the matrix and, the, and you're not aware of the matrix, why would you wake up? Because you have no clue that thing exists. Yes, once you're so deep, how can you get out? You will need help from someone else, but well, they know. One of the characters wanted to go back in. Yeah. That can also happen, yes, exactly. One of the reasons why, I, again, don't move out from Facebook so easily is because I have my network there. If I were to move to another uh, network, which I certainly can at any time, and I would like to have my friends there, I will have to also pull them, and they will have to pull everybody else, and, and then at some point, we might end up with Facebook 2.0, which is even worse than the one that we have right now. Many other comments? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, anybody here has seen the Orville? The Orville started as a parody of a Star Trek and now has become a show in its own. And I, I prepare for this talk, watching a few <laughs> seasons of many things. So I watch Enterprise and Discovery, which has nothing to do with Star Trek, and of course the Orville. And I rewatch Almost Human, all those things. Yeah. There is one episode in the Orville that has been appeared before I've been told in Black Mirror. Don't know if it's the US version, the UK version. You know what you mean. It's where everyone knows everything about everybody else and it's like you're, you can like people on the fly. Yes. The judicial system is likes yeah. and votes. Everything is up and down. And you reach a level where you're so down, then you go into an apology tool. And if people believe you're really, really feel bad about that, and you will never do it, then you go up again. <laughs> but if you continue to go down, then you get a lobotomy, because you have to comply with the rules of society. And the whole planet behaves like this. That's social credit in China. Mm -hmm. Isn't that social credit? Yes. Yep. Also, the other one, this one is now, it's going, the information that it's going to obtain, it's going to help you reduce or increase your health care premiums. 
So what happened in China is now it's under the contract that all employees should at least do the 10,000 steps daily. Secondary market, now you have a person that comes into the office, pick up uh, the, the watch and <laughs> goes <Bills> away. <laughs> yes. so they get and all then the he returns and returns the watch. <laughs> Why not? Yeah, for example, take, take Pokemon Go. <laughs> Pokemon Go, it's a, it's, a funny, it's a funny game for those that like Pokemon, but it, when it, it, when it came to the US, it helped teenagers go outside and walk. How strange is that for those people that are usually coming from the US that usually don't walk? Have you seen the size of the sidewalks? Have you seen any sidewalks? <laughs> okay, so at some point, People wanted to gain the system, so they gave their phones or their devices to someone else that will just farm the Pokemons, and then suddenly you will get the legendaries, right? So we, have, we invent tech to have some fun, to have some leisure, and then we eventually create secondary and third markets that we have no clue these things could happen. Anything else? Big Loma Prosper? <laughs> <laughs> like Graftar's hammer, you shall be avenged. <laughs> uh, we have a couple of minutes, but I guess it's, uh, I mean, yeah. to see if they've made, you know, made fixed mistakes in like interpreting their uh, conversations, and a lot of people are okay with, you know, that being in their house, right? Um, and uh, and they use it, right? Uh, and and lots of more devices are building that integration in. So like you buy a smart thermostat, and then now it has Alexa, right? You buy a TV, and it's got Alexa, on it. and then. You know, you buy a toaster and it's got Alexa in it. So, like, how do you, you know, like... Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> you have to, like, start treating your house as, like, a Xbox. network environment with, like, firewalls and things like yeah. that. Like. Xbox no. with kids. Yes, I mean, Alexa's all no. yeah. Okay, Xbox kids, there was another comment there. You, I think you, you were... Breaking yeah, there is there, there's a comment right over there. We, we try to go for the easy path. Yes, we're lazy.
Now we are going into a, a, a society that we are having to explicitly make this kind of system. So I, for example, Airbnb, you grade the people that are staying in your house. You also grade the people that are renting. So we are building this transaction on who we are based on a specific metrics that are being outside. So for example, I'm a, I, I'm a really good um, visitor or of, of Airbnb because everybody has liked me or I have a great score. And that also worries me because now my identity and my value and my concept of self it's first being like dictated in a metric that I don't have any say so. I mean, I, I, I cannot say, uh, no Airbnb, you should not grade this of, in your metrics, or you should probably add our eating habits, or you should, I don't have any say. And they have a number that represents me. That's super scary. Well, I think it comes down to this Uncertainty is kind of turn off in a sense because you always want to know how much insurance you want to give an employee based on his you know previous medical history. You always want to know if the person's going to trash your house if you go it's going to you know you go live in it for a couple of years. So I can only see companies more and more trying to push for this kind of rating system because they want to make sure that you know when you attend the Airbnb you don't trash their house. If anything to expand on that, it's this desire for simplicity at this point because human beings are one heck of a complex machine, and I don't think anybody has figured out how to model those at all. Um, that being said, a single number is so much easier. A little eight-bit integer, one. how difficult can that be? And so, um, in our desire for everything to be simplified in life, we start to go and start abstracting things away. So now, somebody who's a great house guest or is just simply rated by other beings, and it's effectively um, a system where eventually people will find ways to start abusing it, or people will find out that they are going to st start distrusting this system, or eventually maybe it will be the reality where we succumb to it, and it will become as simple as the China's social credit score, where you are now um, rated through the eyes of whoever chose the system. So I suppose that there's a bit of a responsibility on our behalf to respect the fact that we are very complex beings and we cannot just be simplified down despite how much we want to go and try to make simple life for other people using our systems. Yep. I think it goes deeper than that. Actually, if you look at a lot of the, a, the AI, it tries to similarly do the same type of thing. It tries to put, some, put us all into like these singularities and, and uh, sort of ignore the, the, the complexities of, of the, that we face every day. And I was trying to make sense of data. I was trying to find simple patterns and things like that in the data. And, and the models and stuff that they use, um, I think, you know, really start narrowing things but very badly. It's not only AI. I mean, we, al we already have the results of applying a simplistic solution to complex problems. So, for example, uh, there love it. They vote the for cobras. No, the cobras in India. Yeah, so at some point in India, they, they had an infestation of cobras, or at least the, uh, the, the British rule said, cobras are bad, we need to get rid of them. So you're going to pay money for those people that bring in cobras. Well, so people start to bring cro cobras, and they got money out of that. So you know what an entrepreneur did? They start breeding more cobras, <laughs> because they want more money. And then the British said, oh, this is bad. We're not going to give you money for the cobras. So what happened? They ended up with more s snakes in the out, because the breeder says, well, if you're not giving me any money, then just well, I'm going with these things. I'm not going to feed them. They'll well, go out. I, I, think you, I think you brought out a point, right? It's like any system where you grade or score, people are, are very soon going to figure out how to game that system to get good scores, especially if it means a lot. Mm -hmm. So the question is, like, you know, how do you game the Airbnb scores? You know, it's like, how do people game the Travelocity scores and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. I mean, this has been happening much like forever like people have been gaming social media scores but see underline that so gaming the system in the way at least the way that I see it implies I want to get some benefit without investing too much into that and the investment could be monetary it could be the time could be effort you name it you want to give less to the system to gain more why do we want to do this 
because we, we like to accumulate things, because we are seeing that the, the, most, the, the more that we have of something or some things, we are better. The accumulation of wealth. And in, again, coming back to Star Trek, that concept, even though it still exists in other cultures, in other races, in other planets, humanity has grown out of that. And they believe now in the better model says they want to, they, yes, they, they want to continue, they continue to accumulate things. Knowledge, which, I guess, they, they don't know go about saying, oh, I got this knowledge and then I'm not gonna share you with you, but I think it's a little bit better than what we're doing right now. Can we, can we reach those places? Can we reach that level? I don't know, I wish we can. Definitely not in this generation. Can we do things so that we can help the future generations get there with the current technology that we have, the way that we reason about technology? I'm hopeful. Your point of view may be different. You can get, get away from that. Also, a very important part of the, of the fraud is you don't know this. But human, human nature is also very good at if something is already normalized and a specific behavior is normalized, even if it goes against your values, you're still going to be less prone to react towards that. So there, during Trump and the outcomes of uh, they were analyzing the tone and the, the words that we were using. And for example, in the past, the person will have been reacting more strongly towards uh, racist uh, wording. And but it has started to, to happen so much in the news, so much that even if you are considered, you don't consider yourself racist and you consider yourself uh, a person that respects or try to fight against this, that people started to be more mute because they, they said, this is normal. I don't, I don't agree. I would have strongly opposed to that action or speech, but now it's fair game. Okay. So that's the worst part. You may not change your values, but you're not reacting as before. Um, in addition to that, we're sitting in an delve into group science and software engineer and you know what how backgrounds of these applications work. We have a frame of mind to say that this is probably not going in the right direction. But the majority of people who are not in the same position as us are not going to make the same decisions. And if you unplug from a world that's still plugged in, it's not <laughs> going to be seen. 
This was supposed to be a movie, <laughs> not a documentary. I, I believe that the, one of the directors says this. This is a probable future. I hope we, it doesn't come to this. It was supposed to take 500 years. <laughs> 500 years, not like a, like a decade, yes. <laughs> All right, well. Um, I don't want to end in a depressing note. <laughs> <laughs> so let me do something better. Uh, that. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, uh, for your time. And uh, keep thinking about how the current tech that we use shapes your reality and what little steps you might want to do in order to Keep making your life better and the life of your neighbors better without doing something that, that should not be done. Thanks.